college level, say in the STEM fields or into Silicon yeah. Valley, there's this move that, that there should basically be lowered requirements, and yet it's the m most meritocratic, most aggressive yes. yeah. thing, and it just seems a complete mismatch where it you're is. with these libertarians who essentially are, you know, most of us, there's not even very many American-born whites, right? most of the people are large, or they're foreigners, yeah, yeah. and only 40% of our engineering school post-PhDs are from America, so it, like, this sort of reparation against these people from India, it makes I, I, yeah. you, you no are, sense. I right? think like, you're, you're <laughs> describing perfectly, I think, the future of the affirmative action debate, which has um, up until now been mostly about whites, blacks, and Hispanics. Asians, as their numbers grow, are I think you're going to see more backlash here. It started out in California. Um, even after the, the, uh, the ban on racial preferences in higher education that California implemented back in the 90s, we saw something that many of us suspected was going on, but now we had the proof, which is once schools couldn't take race into account, Asian enrollment at the elite campuses spiked. Now, they all say, we don't have a cap, Caltech, you know, but we don't have a cap, we don't have a cap. But what happened? Asian enrollment spiked, showing that, in fact, they had been artificially capping the number. And at these elite schools, it is a zero-sum game. There are only so many freshman seats at the University of Texas at Austin. And slots saved or put aside for blacks and Hispanics are, are slots that can't go to, to other groups. And so the the the... What are the proponents of, of, of affirmative action trying to reconcile? They're trying to reconcile um, equal opportunity for individuals with group preferences, two irreconcilable things. But they also now have to explain why Asians should be disadvantaged well, because of what... Right? Like well, person, writ large, but they have to argue, they have to now defend or argue or explain <laughs> why Asians should be disadvantaged because of what whites did to blacks. That's, that's where we're going. And, 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 and these, you have a few lawsuits. I think Harvard's part of one of them. Um, the next fight, you know, the, the, the affirmative action uh, for the lawyers in the room will know that the affirmative action fights are usually over the Equal Protection Clause. But now there are some suits winning their way through the courts that are going to use Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which basically says if you're an institution that accepts federal money, you can't be discriminating by race or taking race into an account, which means even private institutions cannot uh, uh, have these, these, these affirmative action policies. That's the, that's the argument that these latest lawsuits are bringing to the court. Um, and Asians are the plaintiffs in, in these... Um, in these suits, so we'll see, we'll see where it heads. But I think that is going to be largely the future of the uh, affirmative action debate. You're going to see more Asian voices, um, and and there was a move in California. Uh, Jerry Brown came into office. He had the supermajority uh, in the in the assembly and the Senate. He started grabbing everything off the shelf. He's going to try and ram through. And one thing he wanted to try and do was reverse the referendum in '96 that ended race-based admissions in, in, um, in college admissions at the University of California system. He tried to get his supermajority legislature to pass this. Asian lawmakers stopped this effort. They said, oh, no, 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 no. We are not going back to this old system. They stopped it cold. And I don't think that's the only place um, they're going to they're gonna raise their, their, their hand there and, and, and push back. Uh, another point I wanted to make about um, Asian groups that relates to what I was saying earlier about um, a focus on political power, um, which is something the Civil Rights Movement did back in the 60s. It was a conscious effort. We are going to focus on, I mean, part of the, part of the, the thinking with the Voting Rights Act was that it would lead to more black elected officials. It wasn't just about right access to the ballot. The goal was to increase the number of black elected officials. That political power would then redound to the black underclass and help lift them up. That's why I included those figures on the number of black elected officials we now have in this country. It was successful in that regard. We do have a lot of black stuff. Black people have a lot of political clout in this country, but it has not redounded to the black underclass. And again, there are people who will who have, who, have, who have studied this and said we should never have expected it to. Most other groups in this country did it in the reverse. 
they lifted themselves socioeconomically first. They worried about elected office later. And those groups that did the reverse, like, say, the Irish, who had these political machines running your Philadelphias and your Bostons and your New Yorks at the turn of the 20th century, those groups rose slower than groups who went with economic advancement first. And I think Asians are the latest example of this. Group hitting it out of the park in terms of household incomes, representation in the professions, educational attainment, how much political clout do Asians have in America? And has it been a barrier to their progress? And again, I think that's just the latest example that going the political route was the wrong way to go fundamentally, uh, a fundamental um, misstep by the, by the civil rights movement. And that continues to be pushed by uh, civil rights leaders today.